Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the June Community IT Innovators webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on SharePoint and your nonprofit. My name is Johan Hammerstrom. I'm the president and CEO of Community IT and the moderator for this webinar series. Before we begin, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our companies. Wait. Next slide, please. Sorry. I'm okay. Oh, sorry, Steve. Um, Community IT is a 100% employee owned company, and our team of almost 40 staff is dedicated to helping nonprofit organizations advance their missions through the effective use of technology. Community IT are technology experts, and we have been consistently named a top 200 North American managed services provider by MSP Mentor. And now it's my pleasure to reintroduce today's presenter, Director of IT Consulting, Steve Longenecker. Hello, Steve. Hi. Steve leads our SharePoint practice team, and he's going to describe at first how SharePoint has become a lot easier than ever to implement. And then he'll show some of the training material that he uses uh, to train our clients during our projects. Our intention is that experiencing a very, very abbreviated end user training today will provide you with an opportunity to learn about some of the great functionality that SharePoint offers. And we hope to leave you with a strong sense of the state of the art of SharePoint today, because SharePoint has changed pretty dramatically over the last four or five years. So that you come away from this webinar with a better idea of how SharePoint may be a solution for your nonprofit organization. So it's pretty straightforward, right, Steve? You should be able to tackle that. That's right. All right. Looking forward to it. Um, okay, yeah, so as um, as jo Johan just said, um, my my intention is to talk a little bit about how we uh, do SharePoint implementations from the from the ten thousand foot view and then dive into some of these training materials. Um, I think this is I've been doing a lot of these recently and i and i and I think that um, sharing them with you might give you give many of you um, insight to some of the things that have changed for us. So starting first with um, sort of how things have changed uh, from from the past to the present with share, our SharePoint implementations. So uh, our our early SharePoint implementations, we, we expected and, and the design of SharePoint was such that you were supposed to use browser for almost all of your SharePoint access. Um, and And today there's rich integration between SharePoint and, and SharePoint, by the way, includes OneDrive and um, Teams, all of that, anything that's file sharing pretty much has SharePoint as the, as the platform on the back end in the Office 365 suite of services. So there's now a rich integration between that platform and um, the operating system folders, like through File Explorer or, or Mac OS Finder um, through uh, the Sync client. Also the Office Desktop suite has direct hooks into uh, SharePoint. And um, and the browser remains a good way to access things. So this is this present uh, uh, description is going to be a repeating theme as I go through these next couple slides. In the past, um, because we had a browser for access, we had to build SharePoint libraries in a browser-friendly way. Um, nowadays, because there's integration with the operating system folders through the Sync client, uh, it's very easy to navigate a traditional folder hi hierarchy. So let me just say very quickly what that means. Uh, now let me go to the next slide because I think it says it here. So that flat file structure um, that we had to have for SharePoint libraries required a lot of metadata. This is because if you are in a browser and you have a bunch of files that are in this cloud store that you're accessing to the browser, clicking down through eight levels of folders to get down to the sub 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 folder that has the file you want Every click takes five seconds, maybe six seconds, maybe 10 seconds, depending on your bandwidth and, and the heavy duty, uh, and, uh, how much the, um, you know, the SharePoint platform is being used by all the millions of people that use SharePoint. Um, and it could be slow. So instead we would have, let's say in a library that had 4,000 files in it, all 4,000 files might be in one, just in the root of the library or just one level of folders. And we would use columns with metadata to help filter and sort um, and find um, those files. Um, 
it was just a fact of life with SharePoint. Now that we have this uh, sync client like Dropbox, um, it's very different and you can just, you're syncing everything from SharePoint, you're looking at it potentially in File Explorer or Finder if you're a Mac user, and you can just, you know, click down through the folders very quickly, just like you click down through folders very quickly on in File Explorer and get to the files you need to get to. Uh, in the past, and this is just, I'm just building this case here, but in the past, because we had this whole different way of presenting files in a new platform called SharePoint, it was very different than people's, uh, our clients' traditional file servers. And so implementations were very expensive because we had to account for all the hours spent reorganizing the way we organize our files and folders. And we were gonna get away from using folders. We had to think about dividing up the libraries. What was, uh, what was the metadata going to be? We had to design custom uh, taxonomy. Um, there was a lots and lots of meetings discussing the way to do this. And, and now we just do a forklift. Um, we don't necessarily forklift an entire uh, share of, uh, from a file server that's you know maybe your P drive, everything to one library. We still wanna maybe break things up um, into smaller bytes than that. But within those smaller bytes, we don't mind at all having you know five, six, seven layers of folders. It's no big deal. Um, and it's easy and it's easy for the staff at the clients to sort of get with this new platform because it, they, the way they access the files in the new platform is more or less the way they accessed them before. And therefore, yes, in the past implementations were hard um, because we had to train users how to use that uh, metadata tagging system and they didn't want to. Um, and now um, we've had quite a few implementations where I really don't like doing just one uh, training. I like doing maybe two. We've sometimes we've done three, but it's become pretty easy to do like maybe two hour and a half trainings or hour trainings with a half an hour left over for questions and so on. And, and it goes a long way. And at, at the, for the most part, um, I'd say there's still some end user support afterwards, but it's not as much as you'd think. And people are pretty comfortable moving forward um, with what uh, with SharePoint without much more change management than that. So I have a slide here about keys to success for SharePoint implementations. This is still some of these are 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 new uh, for as of like not like today, but this is the way it is nowadays. And, and it was, wasn't this way in the past. Some of this stuff is was the pa true in the past and is still true today. Um, so we definitely want to have uh, everybody on, in the in the organization that's moving to SharePoint, you have Windows 10 computers and Office 365 Pro Plus, the latest, greatest version uh, of the desktop suite, sometimes called um, the evergreen version because it's always being updated. We used to just say, hey, you need to have Office 2016 or better or even Office 2013 or better. But as I've just seen that the um, the version of, the subscription version of, of, of the desktop suite is, is um, always getting better, always being integrated more tightly and in new ways with um, with SharePoint and Teams and OneDrive, the Office 365 uh, file sharing services. Um, it just makes sense for, for us to, to really strongly recommend the, the full Office 365 desktop suite. Um, Windows 10 is very important because, well, Windows 7, as you have heard from us, and you know everything but Windows 10 is going, is hit end of hitting, end of life and won't be patched anymore um, uh, after the end of this year. Um, so it, we, it doesn't really, this is a requirement that you have to meet for other reasons anyway, but Windows 10 has the ability to do what's called um, files on demand, which I'll talk about in a later slide, but it makes the sync client work a lot better, particularly for laptops that have small hard drives. You should have your email already in Office 365, um, if that's possible. Uh, we have had a couple clients who are Google Suite users who have still moved ahead with SharePoint as their as their file sharing. There are some um, significant drawbacks with that approach. I, I think for both of the clients that I'm talking about, it's, it, the system is working, so it is possible. But there's a lot of integrations where like you share files or share things in, um, in the Office 365 suite and the Office 365 suite of services knows about the fact that you have an, a mailbox. And so it wants to send to the Office 365 mailbox. And if that's not actually 
the mailbox that you use because you have a Google mailbox that is actually your mailbox, it can be problematic. So it'd be nice if, uh, in terms of being, for sure being successful if email is an Office 365 and you're an Office 365 user already. Um, we, do, we do do better if the existing fo folder file structure on the, on the file server that we're migrating from is clean and intuitive and makes sense, because since we are doing a forklift, um, we'd like to start with um, you know, source material that more or less works and makes sense for the organization already. Um, if there's a lot of cleanup and like reorganizing of files and folders that needs to happen, we kind of like to view that as a pre-project uh, um, task that's not really part of the, the migration. It, it, it can be um, prioritized and um, invested in because of the SharePoint migration, but I think of that as a separate thing. Um, and then we do still want, this is something that's always been true for SharePoint implementations in terms of being a key to success. I really emphasize that we need to have clear wins for the users um, that are going to be using it, even though the change management's gone down a lot and um, and uh, it isn't hard anymore to use SharePoint. I still, it's still changed. There's still a little bit of a difference in, how, in people's expected, you know, what you need to do. And if there's no reason to do it because no one needs remote access to files, uh, everyone only works in the office and they come to the office every day. Um, and why are we doing this? Not just because, I, I don't want the reason to be, we're, we're, we have to replace our file server because it's old, because that's not a win for a user. That's a win for um, the person who has to pay for a new server. Um, and so I'd I like it when SharePoint is, is um, solving pain, pain points. And usually the biggest one is remote access. Uh, sometimes it's also co-authoring is really a, a win. People are really excited about the ability to co-author. Um, there are other ways. Uh, mobile access on mobile devices is another win. Anyway, something something to offer users besides uh, we're just doing this change and you have to get with it. Um, it it makes for a better a better project. Um, and finally, obviously, with any project, support from leadership goes a long way. All right. So that was implementations. Now I'm shifting gears and I'm talking about um, I'm, I'm I'm revealing slides from from the, some of the trainings that I've been doing recently. Uh, people, if there are people in the audience who have received training from me, uh, you may not recognize a single slide. I've doctored some of them up, I've changed them. Uh, PowerPoint, you know, uh, the, the, the latest version of PowerPoint with the Office 365 has artificial intelligence that's constantly suggesting new ways to design slides and I'm, I'm always dickering around. So it is a little bit different. I'll also warn that I am combining what sometimes is two sessions over an hour and a half each into what looks like to be about 40, 45 more minutes and I'm gonna fly. Um, there will be opportunity, well, we have a slide that says if there are questions and if we get to that slide in time, there, I'll answer questions. Um, also, I will, I will have a slide inviting you to contact me directly at the end of this. Um, I'm happy to, to follow up with people individually. I, I'm pretty passionate about SharePoint and glad to share more about it um, later. All right, so jumping in, this is the basics first. All right, so first of all, I tell people what it is. What is Office 365 file sharing? And as I alluded to earlier, um, Office 365 file sharing, actually SharePoint is the name of the platform and you do use that, hear that term all the time, um, but um, it's not just SharePoint. OneDrive is a special version of SharePoint. Um, it's my SharePoint, it's a SharePoint for private, for private folders and files. And then Teams is a sort of a whole big thing um, for collaboration between groups of people, even uh, large groups of people, but certainly small groups of people. And it has a whole lot of things packed into it, but one of the things that a, a team's uh, team has is a, a file share um, or file shares if you have multiple channels and multiple folders, but that's all built on SharePoint. In any case, all of these, all of these files that we're talking about are stored in, on Microsoft-owned servers in a Microsoft-owned data center somewhere. I suspect that a lot of our clients, uh, data, the data center is probably somewhere in Northern Virginia. That seems to be a popular place to put data centers, um, but that's what Office 365 file sharing is. Then I always do a slide where I pitch you know, the advantages of it, because again, I want this to be a win for the people who are at the training, so it's not just them doing the, something that because they've been told they have to. So I emphasize the fact that there's now effective sync, so it's like Dropbox, and um, users are usually familiar with, with the Dropbox model, um, either from, from uh, 
from actual business work and, and then, but certainly from like private life, you know, from personal life, people use Dropbox all the time. I talk about the fact that there's now versioning and how exciting it is not to have to name files over and over go again with V1, V2, V Steve, V Johan, V final, V final, final, V not final after all, you know, just, just save the file and you can always roll back and roll forward um, because it's all versioned in the, in the platform itself. The robust search functionality can be really great. Um, finding files in on a file server, um, there is search functionality, but it gets a lot better when you're talking about um, Office 365 SharePoint and OneDrive and so on. There's artificial intelligence in some of the search stuff that's going on in SharePoint. Uh, they're leveraging things like big data and, and what they call the office graph. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool, um, or it is cool. The tight integration with Microsoft Office, this is the stuff where if you are a, a already someone who likes using Word or Excel or PowerPoint, or if, if anyway, if you like it or not, if you do use it all the time, the fact that that Microsoft's sort of preferred way of you saving those files and opening those files is from an Office 365 file store, um, it's to your advantage if you're in that stack. That leads right to the next one, which is that you can co-author documents, um, and not just in the browser like you can with Google Docs, but you can actually co-author in Word um, or Excel where one person's typing away on one page of a document and somebody else is typing away on a different page of the document at the same time, and both at the same time, those, those changes that people are making are being streamed back to the authoritative version in the Microsoft Data Center, wherever that is. Lots of data, lots of security, and I have, sometimes I put a whole slide on about security. I'm not going to with you all today, but there's a lot you can read about security. Microsoft takes security very seriously. And then the fact that it's mobile, and that's what, this, that's what the screenshot that's here is, is showing, is um, when I did a search in the Android store for Microsoft, these are all the things that turn up. So all of these, um, all of these uh, applets for Android in this, uh, the, the Mac, the, the, I, the iOS store has the same um, stuff in it. Um, you know, they, they are, except for the, the 365 admin applet there, that's the A. Um, the rest of them use leverage SharePoint in the back end one way or another. Then we do still start with the browser. So even though I emphasize that the browser is no longer the dominant um, um, way of accessing Office 365 and no longer uh, constrains and guides all of the choices that we make in a SharePoint implementation, it is good for people to know how to access SharePoint in a browser because it is what was SharePoint was originally designed for. And so there are sometimes things that you want to do in the browser. I am in the SharePoint in, in Community IT's implementation of SharePoint in a browser all the time. And I know that that it is a, a good way to work. So um, we generally in our implementations take the, the, the main um, sort of easy to remember link, which is, um, would it be citydc.sharepoint.com or whatever, you know, client name, sharepoint.sharepoint.com. We usually take that page and put it some sort of index on it to the, to the other SharePoint resources that might be buried in um, uh, more obscure URLs. Um, OneDrive is always um, at the, at the uh, URL that, uh, you know, if you type in that, you know, obviously client name is generic, but if you type in your your client name with that dash my.sharepoint.com, it knows who you are and it takes you to your OneDrive. Um, one thing I wanted to point, the reason I have that little note about citydc.sharepoint.com, we opened our SharePoint tenant many, many, many years ago. We uh, thought of ourselves as CityDC at the time. At some point we rebranded, no one really None of our clients seem to ever really care that we weren't City DC anymore. We are community IT. I still have clients that call us that call us City or City DC, and it's fine. But we would like to be https colon slash slash communityit.sharepoint.com. But in fact, that is one of the things that's sort of impossible to change without a full tenant to tenant migration, which is way more work than uh, we're willing to do for ourselves, and which we would ever recommend a client undertake. So that's a downside to the way SharePoint is works right now, maybe at some point Microsoft will make it easier to rename um, sort of that identifier, but that identifier is pretty static. Um, so if whatever it is that you that you got when you opened your Office 365 account is what you're going to keep um, for now anyway um, through, through the rest of time. Then I do a slide, I'm not going to share the slide, but I do a slide about how you upload the files to SharePoint in a browser, how you open files 
from SharePoint in a browser. I do a slide showing what the browser layout looks like. Um, I, may, I emphasize that every view um, in SharePoint, everything you do in SharePoint is a, the U URL will change and it's a unique URL. So in this screenshot, there's a folder called North Wind. If I clicked on it, the URL up there actually might not look any different because I've scrunched that web page down, but, but the, after the dot, 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 some of those characters will change and it will be a different URL. So if I bookmark this page, I will always, when I click on that bookmark, I will go to the SharePoint practice library and it will have what you see here. But if I go to Northwind folder and bookmark that bookmark, then I will go to the Northwind folder. So anything can be bookmarked and it's, use, it's worth users doing that. The eye at the far right, the little, I wrote, my hand drew a red box around the eye with a circle around it. That stands for information, always good. You can, if you click on it when it's just looking at the library, it will tell you changes that have been made to the library, what's been recently uploaded, what files have been recently changed and who did that. Um, if you have a, a file checked, then it will tell you the properties of the file, uh, what kind of versions it's gone through, who, who created it, who's been modifying it most recently and so on. The funnel um, in the toolbar helps you find documents through filtering. So that's like the filtering button. Um, columns can be synced. So if I, right now it's um, sorted by, uh, by the name, but I could also sort it by um, the date modified or by who modified it and, and so on. Um, the search up there at the top is an, another plug for how good search is in the Office 365 um, SharePoint um, cloud version. So if you do a search here, you it it's pretty great. Not just that it you know goes by file name, but also the contents of the text within the files. But also maybe um, it might even like consider you know who modified the files and and what your relationship to that person is within the company because it you know, Office 365 keeps track of all sorts of things in a big data kind of way. I mean, it's all you know, it's like you know, it's aggregated, depersonalized information, but still, um, uh, yeah. And then the sync button in the middle, that's the key um, to, uh, and that's, I'm not necessarily, it's a little bit out of order, but um, for, because I took it from a, a slide deck, but the sync button is the key to sort of setting up uh, the Dropbox functionality that we're going to talk about um, in a few minutes. Then we talk about OneDrive in my trainings. Um, and this is um, what I said before, that OneDrive is uh, your private files. Um, it's my SharePoint. You can share files from OneDrive, but it's sort of still owned by you. And the person who you're sharing it with will have to access the file through the link that you send them. Um, so it's not as convenient for collaboration as sharing, uh, as having your files stored in a SharePoint library or a team library, but you can do it. And it's convenient that you can because there are times when people want to do that. Um, you sync your OneDrive files, um, but uh, other people can't sync the files that you've shared from your OneDrive. They have to go through the link to get to them. Um, so I just talk a little bit about this. Interestingly, um, we do some, some of our SharePoint implementations start with OneDrive. So we do a whole bunch of training on OneDrive. In fact, this is a common way for us to do it. We'll do a bunch of trainings on OneDrive and we'll, and we'll get everybody, if people have an H drive or a, an S drive or whatever, a, a drive that's like just for them privately on their file server now, and people are used to using that, then we'll, we will um, migrate those files to individual people's OneDrive or have them do it and do that first and get people used to using OneDrive as, as sort of the first step, the entree to, um, to SharePoint while they continue to use shared files on their P drive or whatever uh, on the file server, but they get started with OneDrive. They get to learn uh, the system that way. And then we shift um, to the, the, the shared files, the, the, the other network shares um, afterwards. Now I have, then I talk about the, the OneDrive sync client in our trainings. Um, so here the idea is that it's like Dropbox. And I have a bullet point dedicated to that fact because Dropbox is what people are used to and familiar with. And um, it's a big deal that now it is like Dropbox. And I will say that in our early implementations, again, comparing past to present, the, the what's called the OneDrive sync client um, 
wasn't that good. And so it would break all the time. And, um, and so that's why we really emphasized uh, the browser access. But Microsoft has iterated on the OneDrive Sync client. In fact, what's the, called the OneDrive Sync client is sometimes referred to as the next generation sync client. The NGSC is a good term to use for Googling things sometimes if you're on the tech side of stuff. Um, it's a totally different piece of software than the original sync client. And it's, very, it's not as bulletproof as Dropbox's, but it's, it's very good and it works very well. So what it does is it, it syncs a, a library um, and the, the, the place that it shows up in File Explorer are, have red hand-drawn boxes around them. So OneDrive is, is its own thing, but then the shared team libraries um, show up with like a, there's an office building node and each library shows up as a separate node underneath it. Um, so I have the SharePoint um, practice demo library here in my screenshot um, and it's so I'm accessing it through File Explorer I could also access it through Finder if I was a Mac user I'm it's the last time I'm going to say that but it's true um, and pretty much the functionality of the sync client is uh, good across both Mac and Windows platforms um, and it's constantly syncing as long as you're online and if you're offline um, then you have whatever you have uh, synced to your to your computer available to you um, and, and, and you can uh, open it locally and then it will sync in the background when you get back online. Um, one thing to say is that the OneDrive sync client is what it's called, but it's a bad name. Microsoft marketing people um, sometimes I think um, miss the, the boat. It should be called the SharePoint sync client because it is the, it's the piece of software that syncs all SharePoint properties, whether they're OneDrive, SharePoint, or Teams libraries. All of them can be synced. So some magic, because Microsoft uh, built the Sync client, but they also built Windows, uh, they're not as good on uh, Mac OS in this, in, uh, they don't own Win the Mac OS, but they have worked hard to make it this true for Mac OS too, um, also. And um, so it's pretty cool. The, um, the, this is the thing I was saying about how Windows 10 is uh, sort of necessary. So, when you're just syncing, um, like maybe your OneDrive folder, it's not that big oftentimes, and it's not gonna fill up your laptop's hard drive um, to do that. But once we're talking about forklifting an organization's entire file server into the cloud, into the Office 365 cloud, and then we're telling people that you should sync all that, well, it was the case until Windows 10 Fall Ed Creators Edition that you had to be careful with syncing everything up there in the cloud because people frequently were uploading from their file servers, you know, maybe a terabyte of data and your laptop, especially your laptop, might only have 128 gigabyte hard drive on it. Um, nowadays, it's more common to be 256 gigabyte hard drives on your solid state hard drives in a laptop, but still not big enough to sync everything. So what's the solution to that? Dropbox, I think, is the one who came up with this first. I certainly saw it first in the Dropbox platform, but Microsoft copied it. Dropbox calls it Smart Sync. Microsoft calls it Files on Demand. But the idea here is that when you sync a library, it doesn't actually sync the contents of the files in the library. It just syncs the names and the dates that it was modified and what kind of file it is and who, um, who modified it last, the metadata of the, of the file but not the contents. So, um, so that means you're not taking up nearly as much space, nearly as much space, because the, the, the amount of space it takes to, to save uh, the word screenshot raw materials is negligible. Um, but if you actually have the contents of that word document called screenshot raw materials, which might include text, it might include uh, pictures that you've pasted into your word document, that takes up space on your hard drive. Now, you can, your laptops, our laptops, laptops can hold lots and lots of files. They just can't hold terabytes of files that have been uploaded from a file server that represents an organization's, you know, 20 years of, of computing, um, you know, with files. So, uh, so you can't sync everything, but you can sync pretty much anything, everything you need to in terms of the contents. But um, by by default, the stuff only the the names are 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 um, are synced. Uh, the other thing that uh, is great about um, 
the sync client is be because Windows uh, knows that this is a special folder that represents files that have been copied or are synced, I should say, synced from um, from an Office 365 data sh file store somewhere. Uh, there's an extra there's an extra piece to the context menu when you right click on something. So in this picture, I'm right clicking on the Excel spreadsheet called Keyword Something. And in the in the context menu, along with open print, edit the usual stuff that you might see, there's now this section that's committed, uh, dedicated to Office 365 stuff. And we've got share, which I'll talk about later, but I will talk about it later, view online, which just basically what that does is pop open the library in a browser that contains the the authoritative, you know, the browser view of this of this um, of this document. And then always keep on this device and free up space. I, I want to just mention that what that does is it's the files on demand um, flip side. So if I was going to get on an airplane and fly to LA um, and be offline for five hours and I wanted to work on a on a uh, on the north wind, whatever that is, the entire time I was up there. And that north wind thing, it wasn't actually the contents weren't actually synced. Before I left, before I got offline. I would right click on that folder and say, always keep on this device and then wait two, three, four minutes for that stuff to actually, the contents to actually sync. Then when I'm in my airplane and I'm offline, I'm not on the internet, I can open, change, modify, and all of that stuff's happening locally on my, just on my laptop. When I get to LA, I plug in, I get on the internet, and then the sync client right away recognizes that I'm back online and it syncs up all the changes. So you can work offline, uh, the sync client allows all that, but uh, you do what you don't want to have happen is you haven't actually synced the contents. You've just synced the name, and then you're offline, and then you want to open the file because it actually doesn't have the file. It doesn't have the contents of the file downloaded yet to your computer unless you've done that ahead of time. That's kind of esoteric and more time than I meant to spend on this, but I wanted to. I do talk about it in the trainings um, in, in some depth. And then the last sync client magic slide. Um, that the Office desktop suite also knows that the synced folders are special. So if you double click on a, a Word document, and I went ahead and put the docx, xlsx, or pptx, or whatever in this, um, in the text here on this slide, because I do want to emphasize that the magic really works, doesn't work when you have the old versions of, of Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. So if you don't have that X in the extension, if it's been saved in what's called like Word 2003 version, then some of this stuff doesn't work. Um, but if you're working with a modern document and you double click on it in your synced folder, it opens up Word like you'd expect. Word launches and then you see the Word. And at first it's actually opening up the local copy. But then because Word recognizes what's going on here, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, what's the word when you give inhuman things, human emotions, the word recognize is not probably the right word. But anyway, Word says this is an Office 365 file. It switches from interacting with the local copy that's synced to your hard drive on your laptop and switches to streaming it to the, um, to the Office authoritative version on, that's in Office 365, again, saved to a server on an, in a data center that Microsoft owns. It does this seamlessly, it's magic, it's awesome though, because then you see this button at the top of your PowerPoint um, application or Word or Excel or whatever, and it says auto save and, it has, and, it, and it's on. And that means that as you're typing, the, cha the changes that you're making are streaming back to the authoritative version that's in the cloud. It gives you more access to things like the version history that's in the cloud. Um, it, uh, if other people open the file also, they are also going to be ending, streaming it to the cloud. And so the two of you can be both streaming, which is what makes co-authoring possible. It's amazing. And it wasn't possible even two years ago. And now it is. And so I, I just I think it's great. And it's great, uh, it's great when I tell people about it. It's great when I'm actually using it uh, with my colleagues at Community IT, which happens all the time. Deep breath. Okay, now we're into the end user training advanced section. So I tell people, this is usually the break between like session one, SharePoint 101, if you will, and then maybe three days later, one week later, whatever session number two, 
which is the advanced training. And I definitely emphasize to people that if you don't do, if all you get is the basics, you will get everything that you can do now with a file server. So that's great. That's really what you need to do to do your job. The sharing and the deep desktop integration stuff is extra. It's great extra, and I think people should know about it, and I'd like people to know about it because I think it just keeps extending what we can do uh, efficiently and well with our with our technological tools. But you don't have to learn this stuff as much. Um, but it is so anyway, because I, I, we do definitely encounter users at our clients for whom this gets to be too much. So I just I just give that caveat that the advanced stuff, you don't necessarily need to use the advanced stuff. It's stuff that you can use and it's nice to be able to. All right, so SharePoint sharing, which gets to be a lot of, the word share starts to become too, too common, but that's the way it goes. Um, it is one of the ways that Office 365 is superior to file server. Right now, um, or not right now, for clients that are using a file server, they generally can't give uh, like an external contact access to their file server. That's generally against um, sort of security policies and you'd have to create a, a user account for them generally for that to happen and then figure out how to give them remote access and so on and so forth. Um, so what you might do is send them a file as an attachment. And if you wanna send um, a document to, to six people, you would send them an, the attachment and you'd have six people in the two line of your email and six different people would get six different attachments. And if you, what you were asking them to do is uh, make edits and get the, get the document back to you, you would get six attachments back that you would then open, try to integrate. Eventually you'd come up with one, one document reflecting all the different edits that you got, unless there were doc, unless two people edited the same paragraph in vastly different ways, in which case you might try to merge that or get them together in a room and try to figure out how to do it. With SharePoint sharing, this applies to OneDrive, Teams, SharePoint, all the above, uh, you send uh, a link, and this can be to people within your organization, um, or, and I say, there is a parenthesis here about if your organization's sharing policy allows it. Almost all of our clients, in fact, all of our clients that we've done this for have gone ahead and made this policy uh, turned on. And I think Microsoft may have shifted uh, the defaults from not allowing external sharing to allowing it um, because it's because it's they recognize that that's what the default should be. People want to be able to share um, from SharePoint. You could own a lot, let's say there was a, a library that had like financial records in it or HR records in it and you really didn't want to give people the opportunity to share it, you could you could stop that. Um, you, you, it is a library by library policy if you if you want to apply it that way. Anyway, when you share a file, the people you share it with are actually accessing the source document. So if I go back to that example, um, if I send a, a sharing link to six people and say, please make the edits, uh, they are going to be editing the source material. And so um, they'll be editing it. Um, if they, well, the changes that they make will be changes they, that are being made to the file that's saved in Office 365. And if somebody, one person makes some edits and then later somebody else makes some edits, uh, they will see the changes that the first person made because they are not getting a, uh, an attachment from me that was just representing my work. They are seeing the work that, that is in Office 365. And I should say there's a lot, of, a lot of control of how this works, which is why it's an advanced topic. So yeah, it does happen through links. So they're long, complex URLs that would be difficult to um, to sort of make up and 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 use as a way to hack into into a document. Um, perhaps not impossible, but um, but they are just like random long strings of random characters that are along with sort of familiar stuff at the front end that says you know citydc.sharepoint.com slash maybe a library name slash and then it starts just giving me a bunch of random uh, characters um, and usually the way we have this set up is that the default share um, that that appears that's offered to you when you say you want to share something is a url that works for anyone in your organization and allows editing we can change that default for different for clients if that's what they don't if they don't want that to be the default but that's the one that we've found works best so that's what you get when you click on share, you'll get a, you'll be offered a long complex link that will only work for people in your organization and will allow them to edit. Um, and you, that link then gets sent to them. 
Um, it could be sent to them in an email that you write. It could be sent to them in an email that's generated by SharePoint. Um, you could chat it to them. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to get that URL to them, but they need to get the URL. And then because it's a URL, it always starts them out in a browser, the online version of Word, Excel, et cetera. And then here I have like a talking about Word online versus Word, the desktop version of Word, because this is a natural place in a training to give that little piece. Um, so yeah, the desktop version is more full featured. Um, and I have some examples there. Um, fonts are interesting. I always used to say that the desktop version has more fonts or many more fonts. Now I'm finding that there's not as big a difference in the, in the numbers of fonts, but they're not the same font. It's like the online version of Word has some fonts that the desktop version of Word doesn't have, which is weird. But I think sometimes fonts are maybe, I think they're, they're copyrighted. And so perhaps Microsoft is buying some, the rights to some in one platform and not the other. Mostly fonts are in both. But it does come up every once in a while that like someone will be editing a document in Word and it'll be in, in, a, in a font that's a, maybe a little obscure, not available in Word Online. The, the document is shared with somebody who is editing it in Word Online, which is great. Word Online is a very good platform. Um, but because it doesn't have that font and it's not Calibri, it's something else, uh, Word Online can't render that font. So it picks the, the best font that's closest to it. And, um, and the person who's typing it probably wouldn't even notice because it looks very close, you know, but it's not the same. So then they make some edits and then um, the person who, who, who shared the document opens the document again in the full version of Word and they can see that person's edits, but they're in the other font, the, the Word Online font, because that's what the font Word Online added them in. We, meanwhile, their, their original font is in place for everything else. And then you can see it because when it's right next to each other, the human eye can pick up these differences. Something to be aware of, you wouldn't wanna like, I mean, it's easy enough to fix. You just select all and then, and then change it to the font that it should be. Um, but you wouldn't wanna send something um, in, without sort of doing that final check in the full version of Word to someone who cares about that kind of a thing, like an important stakeholder who's not in your organization. Um, the desktop version needs you to be signed into the desktop version to access um, the, the Office 365 cloud stuff. So um, that's important. In the, in the online version, and you can see it here, I circled it in red, you can, you can click on a button that says edit in Word um, and that will launch Word and then you'll actually be in the full version of Word. So it, it works. How, you, how do you share something? Well, if you're in the browser, you can check the little circle in front of the, of the icon and then that changes the toolbar at the top and you can choose copy link. You can actually also choose share. Those two buttons have more or less been um, co-evolved, more or less do the same thing. I think at some point soon, the designers will just remove one or the other. But um, at one time they kind of did different behaviors and now they've gotten so close that it's hard to tell the difference. Here I have circled the fact that the default link is there. So um, it doesn't, um, right, that's what the default link is. If I click on that uh, arrow to the right there that says people in community IT innovators with the link and edit, I could choose a different kind of a link. So I could choose um, uh, an external link that, that works for anybody, um, or I could choose a link that only works for specific people. I can, I can make those choices. You can also share directly from Windows Explorer. So if you're in one of those synced libraries, and remember I showed this in this uh, very same context menu um, on a different slide earlier. Um, we have that always keep on this device. That was what I was emphasizing then. Now we can you can share it. If you click on that share button, it basically link opens the same browser window, but now it's it looks like a Windows window, but it's, it has the same stuff in it. Um, you can share directly that way. You can also share from Outlook. Um, when you click on the, if you have a modern version of Outlook and you click on the paperclip to attach a file, the recent items, uh, your, if you don't use SharePoint, you'll see your recent items will be referencing maybe your P drive or your H drive, or your S drive. But if you've been using SharePoint, then the recent items will have uh, a URL type thing. You'll see that it's got um, an address that represents uh, the cloud and you can share it. And if you click on one of those, uh, then you are offered the opportunity to either share it as a link or because there is 
times when people want to share things as attachments, you can also attach it as a copy, in which case it will download it from Office 365 and be a, a regular attachment in, um, in Outlook. There's nothing wrong with attaching files the old-fashioned way. Uh, it's nice to have a choice. You can also share directly from Word, Excel, et cetera. It points to that deep integration between the, the desktop suite and the SharePoint platform. So um, there's two places uh, on, the, on, the, on the most modern versions of, of the desktop suite. It's always available under the file menu, and that's what's in the, uh, the top screenshot, but also in the, in the bottom screenshot up, up on the far right of, of Word. Um, or Excel or PowerPoint or whatever, you have a share button. And it basically launches the, it, everything, all of these buttons get you to the same place, which is it offers you, um, you know, a sharing link and who do you want to send that sharing link to? Um, so I told you there are different kinds of links. Um, anyone is grayed out in this screenshot, interestingly, and that's what happens if the, any, if the external sharing is turned off. Again, most of our clients want us to turn that on so the anyone choice is not grayed out. Um, the, the people in organization name is the default generally. Um, specific people requires you to put an email address in, in it. And then the, and if you put the email address in, the URL basically is tied to that email address. So you can copy the link and send it in the email, in an, in an email to the person. Um, but if they, they will then use that email address um, to, uh, to get to the file. Uh, very, um, it's, it's noteworthy. This sounds great. Oh, specific people, that's what I want. Most of the time, I encourage clients to use the anyone link if it's a file where the, the risks that go with that are, are not too great. And the risks are you're giving a URL to someone that anyone with that URL can access the file in a browser. And if the edit privilege is on, they can edit the file in the browser. That's the risk. Um, they would have to, for, it's, a, it's a long random URL, so presumably they would have to forward that URL to someone else for it to become sort of insecure, so to speak, but they have the option to do that. Specific people will only work for the, for the person with that email address, but specific people, if they're an Office 365 customer, no big deal, because they're probably already all logged into Office 365, and so they're, they're sort of already validated or um, credentialed, but if it's someone who's not an Office 365 customer, then it goes through a familiar but still friction uh, process. They'll say, hey, you, we'd love to give you, a, the browser will launch, and it's, but instead of seeing the document in your browser with the Word Online or Excel Online or whatever um, toolbar, what you'll see, and you'll see the start of that, but they won't actually show you the document. They'll have a little page that says, we need to send a, a, an eight-digit code to this email address. Click, click here for us to send it. So you click the button, then go back to your email, wait 35, 45, 65 seconds for the email to come in, longer sometimes. The email comes in, you open the email, you double-click on the, the eight-digit code, you copy it, you go back to your browser, you paste it in, you click apply, and then you see the document. That's perfectly good security. It's just more security than most people want to deal with most of the time. Um, the anyone link works as long as um, uh, they have the URL. And I think I just, um, this, this, this uh, slide basically says all that. Um, oh, one thing that's interesting, the anyone link um, only allows you to work in a browser. There's no open in Word uh, button there. I, I don't know whether that's a permanent design decision or not. It has to do with the fact that the anyone link is fundamentally less secure. And so I think they're just sort of, uh, well, it, has, it probably has to do with the, way, with the way Word or Excel has to, be, has to sort of validate your credentials. And if, you're, if it's an anyone link, you can't do that. I'm not sure. You can't edit it in, in you, there's no open in Word. That's the bottom line. So you only can edit in the browser. Um, not usually that big a deal, but it's something to consider. Um, same with specific people, uh, except with specific people, if they are an Office 365 customer, in the last, like, literally two months, um, Microsoft's been rolling out what's called business-to-business -business sharing. It's been a big ask from the Office 365 customer universe. So now if two, it's not the case that 
non-Office 365 customers can do this, but if you're interacting with an external person who's also an Office 365 customer, they should be able to edit a document you've shared from your tenant uh, in their version of Word, um, as long as they're an Office 365 customer. Um, unless it's prohibited, which it can be, you can always, they, people can always download it and then, um, and then work in Word or whatever with it. But at that point, they're working with the copy, not the authoritative version. And it is possible to put an expiration date on an anyone share link. Then I have some sharing tips here. Um, and I think I've covered this already. Oh, this is, I didn't cover this last, um, the middle one. Um, track changes does work with this sharing thing. The online version of Word doesn't have a track changes button anywhere. So you people that are working in the online version of Word can't see changes being tracked. They don't know that track changes are turned on or turned off. But if you've turned it on in Word and then you've shared it with them and they make changes, their changes will be tracked. But in general, I would say at Community IT anyway, we've gotten into a lot more of a workflow where when we share documents that are um, being worked on, we go for a lot more for comments. It just seems like it works better for this, for this platform that people make comments. And so instead of me editing someone's um, paragraph, I, may, I might just say, this seems a little awkward. How about this instead? And I just put it in a comment then other people uh, can um, uh, see those comments. Other, other collaborators can see those comments. It, it works really well. Try it if you want, it doesn't, it's not required. Now, the desktop suite integration. When you are working with a modern version of Office, you can actually have uh, your, your SharePoint um, properties surface directly in, um, in like Word and Excel that as a direct place, you're not, you're not say, you don't have to save it to your synced folder and then have it synced. You can just save it directly into SharePoint um, because they make that possible. Um, when you add a place, uh, you choose Office 365 SharePoint. I didn't, I haven't talked about this at all, but OneDrive is also a consumer product. So when you click on the OneDrive there on the right where it says add a place, you're actually talking about a consumer version. I there's a there's another marketing decision. I wish the marketing folks at Microsoft had continued to use SkyDrive, which was what the old the old name for the consumer product was, and left OneDrive be the business product. But now they have two products, both named OneDrive. One's OneDrive for business, but that never really shows up anywhere as a name, but it is. And the other's OneDrive that used to be SkyDrive. Anyway, you circle Office 365 SharePoint, and then that that when you put in your credentials, it adds both. SharePoint and OneDrive automatically if you have a OneDrive um, folder, which most people do if they're Office 365 customers. Um, it will also uh, ask you, and I don't have slides to show this, but I, when I, I do this in the training, it'll also ask you to you know, use this account everywhere on your device. And usually, I, I, I don't usually, I always encourage people to say yes to that. It basically means that Word and Excel and PowerPoint can share credentials that's stored in the Windows 10 Credentials Manager. Um, then there's another checkbox that's checked that says allow my organization to manage my device, which if it is an organization owned device, you should leave checked. But if it's your personal computer and there's no reason you can't do all this syncing and, and integration with the office desktop suite on a personal computer at home, um, and you use a desktop at work and you use a personal computer when you're uh, working from home one day a week or whatever, you can do all these things, but you would probably uncheck the allow my organization to manage my device first um, when you get to that point. One last, uh, well, a couple more things um, and we're basically done. The recent node in Office uh, is, a, is, a, is a great friend once you become a, an active SharePoint OneDrive user uh, because um, specific SharePoint uh, folders can be pinned in that recent, um, in that recent menu. And so I am, um, you know, client documentation is a place I need to save things to all the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a folder that I have pinned or a library that I've pinned. But my recent stuff is down there on below under today, um, you know, and yesterday and last week. And I use that stuff all the time. And then the documents doesn't list the folders, it lists the individual documents. So that's very powerful because it is true that navigating to different SharePoint uh, libraries can be difficult from the sites node, which is the one on the left, which is, again, a marketing person at SharePoint, I mean, at Microsoft, they, at one point they said, we don't like SharePoint, uh, we want the name to be sites. All right, 
I need to keep moving. This is my last training slide. The other office integration, and there's not that much to say about it, but in addition to the share button, which we've talked about before, there's a history button, which shows the version history, and all of these things are working when you're connected to um, the Office 365 cloud directly in, in um, the Office desktop suite. Um, way over on the left is the autosave streaming button, um, but that's not in the screenshot. All right, so I have flown through stuff here and I recognize that I have gone too fast, overwhelmed you, I'm sorry about that, but I wanted to cover a lot of material. Questions, please just send me an email. I will be glad to respond. I can answer questions. I can also just, I can do a demo. So I haven't, de I didn't demo anything. I just did screenshots today. It was the only way to get through the level of material I was trying to get through. But I'm, I have a SharePoint demo library. I'm glad to do a screen sharing session with you. Um, and show you, you know, the stuff in practice. Um, it's cool, it's exciting. Um, you know, maybe we could co-author a document together, um, all those things. Um, and I think at this point, I'm gonna pass the baton back to you, Johan. All right, thank you, Steve. And thank you so much for your time and for sharing all of your expertise with us. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, that was a real deep dive into the, the world of SharePoint and OneDrive. Uh, while at the same time, just kind of being an overview of the different things that you can do with SharePoint and OneDrive. And as helpful as that was, there's there's sort of no substitute for just using it yourself. So if you're not using SharePoint or if, you know, you tried to use it and it didn't go well, or if you're using it and you're not happy with it, I definitely encourage you to contact Steve. He has a ton of experience with SharePoint. Uh, I'm, I am by no means a technical expert in these tools, but we use them internally. And I'm always amazed at how well they work and how seamless it has become. Um, as someone who's used these tools for the last four or five years, I think Microsoft is really starting to fire on all cylinders when it comes to this technology. So if it's something that you have uh, on the back burner that you checked out before, I would encourage you to take a look at it again. Um, so please contact Steve directly. His email is right here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about next month's webinar. So we go even even deeper into the deep dive uh, of our of our technical presentations. The perfect webinar for July: um, Server 2008 and Windows 7 End of Life. Three things you need to know. Uh, there's, as we know from from our inventories and based on what Microsoft publishes, there's still a fairly significant number of organizations that are using Windows Server 2008 and Windows 7 in production. And both of those operating systems are going to be end of life. And um, that, has, that has a specific technical meaning. And um, I encourage you to join that webinar next month if, you're, if you have any, either of those operating systems on your network. So that'll be Wednesday, July 17th from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, we had a, I answered a few questions to the best of my ability because we're out of time. We won't have time for for um, verbal Q and A, but I'm going to send out um, Steve's email address right here, and you can click on it right now. Oops, give me a second. So you should all have that. Cut, copy and paste it. Um, you can send Steve an email. The recording of today's webinar is going to be published later today on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is simply www.youtube.com slash community IT. Why don't I go ahead and just send that out as well. And uh, it has our entire backlog, our back catalog of webinar recordings going back over five years. So there's a wealth of information there. Some of it, you know, some of the ones from three or four years ago may not be as relevant as the technology advances and changes, but certainly the last 12 to 15 webinars um, have some great content. So I encourage you to go check that out. And we publish the slides on our SlideShare account. All of you who have registered for the webinar today will be getting an email with that information. Um, when you get to the YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe. If you like the video, you can hit the like button if you love it subscribe and uh, you'll get updates when we publish new webinars to to our YouTube channel. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to you joining us for future webinars. Thank you again, Steve. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.